and we have the last speaker. And I'm really proud to present Mirella. She was in Hasselblad Institute before, but now she is uh, in US in the University of Colorado, and she is a real biohacker. <laughs> Let us welcome her. Thank you so much for the introduction. For each one of you that stayed uh, until this time, I'm very honored to present in front of you. And for the ones watching at home, thank you for being with us. So I would like this evening to think together with you about the following question. To what extent can we change healthcare? And more specifically, how far can we move a very crucial aspect of, of each diagnosis into the hands of people? And I'm, I'm trying to do my best tonight to convince you that this can be achieved using a device called digital microfluidic biochip that you're gonna see in the next video. So what you have here is an electronic device that contains an array of electrodes. These yellow patches are called electrodes. And it manipulates droplets, it transports droplets by merely applying electrical voltage on the desired location. Now, you learned a lot today about the importance of droplet-based analysis. So you can imagine that such a device called a biochip can disrupt the current diagnosis process that involves going to the doctor, then you know, the doctor sends the samples to the lab, then after a while you get the results back and then they finally come back to you. So imagine that instead of this process, we get a biochip in doctor's cabinet. So you get the results while you're reading a newspaper or after a few hours when you're checking, after you're checking your emails. And then by a stretch of imagination, let's think what it will do if we get such a biochip with us in our purse, in our pockets. Um, how much it can disrupt the way we do diagnosis. We can have it at any time, anywhere. So pretty much what I want to do is that I want to use biochips in order to create a generic medical platform. The question is that um, this work doesn't involve only building some hardware, a device, and making some applications for it. It also involves covering expertise how do we embed the expertise of a lab scientist and the expertise of a doctor? And my first answer to that, and what I try to do with my research, is to use software. Using software and computer science to embed expertise that we need for such systems. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I call bioprotocol compilation. Now, this is a common bioprotocol used in diagnosis. And um, for those that are not aware of what the bioprotocol is, is the sequence of steps that are done in a laboratory in order to achieve something. And what you can see here that I highlight is a sequence, sequences like add 100 microliters, remove all liquid, add eight drops. Pretty much when I look at it from my computer science eyes, I see a, a program with fluids. So I went ahead and modeled it as a graph where each node is an operation on droplet, like dispensing a droplet, and each edge represents a dependency. For example, we have two droplets that are being dispensed, and then the results of the dispensing operation, they go into the next operation, which is a mixed operation. Mixed operation. Now, we can use the graph model to model a complete bioprotocol by simply putting the operations and the dependencies between them. The setup that I imagine is that an expert designs a bioprotocol, the bioprotocol is then compiled um, using an algorithm that I built, then the results are stored on a microcontroller and um, that knows how to control the droplet, and after the fluids are input, the biochip starts running the bioprotocol as um, desired, as established. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I implemented the compilation and what it actually means. So, a compilation takes as input um, the bioprotocol modeled as a, a graph, the one that I showed before, and the architecture of your biochip. You can have any design of a cartridge. Before, you've seen a very regular design, but it can be a very different type of design. And what compilation does is that first it looks at the operations in the graph, 
For example, this is extremely slow, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, for example, we need to assign for each one of these operations a certain um, re a resource on the cartridge. Uh, for these sample operations, we assign the sample reservoir. For the next set of operations, we assign the reagents reservoir because we dispense reagents. For the operations that dispense buffers, we assign the buffers reservoir. Now, the next set of operations are all mixing operations, and mixing operations that can be, they can be performed in many ways and at different locations on the chip. So we have a library from that that we have to select from different types of mixers according to the types of fluids. So we select for these types of mixers the first mixer, and for these other types of mixes, the second type of mixer. Okay. After we selected the mixer, the next step that the algorithm does, it places these mixers on the chip. It has to decide on the location of the mixers. So in this case, we decided the location to be there. And then the third step is scheduling. That's pretty much deciding when to schedule the operations and where. So here's the timeline. These two are these two first dispensing operations, and they happen on these reservoirs on the chip. So then at the next time, the next operation ha happened, and so on. So this is pretty much, at high level, how a compilation algorithm works. Now, all these mini problems, sub-problems that I present, is scheduling, placement, and routing, are AMP complete. This is a computer science term, but it translates as they are difficult problems. So there are multiple solutions to them. And for example, I try to be very creative, and in terms of placement, instead of using rectangular mixers, sometimes I look at available space and I make non-regular mixers. So I wrote a couple of algorithms for placement, routing, scheduling, and one of my compilations proved to be the fastest at the time I published it. So I decided to use for a very special context, a context in which you have sensors on the biochip and you have feedback from the sensors and according to that feedback you need to recompile really quickly real time and adjust what happens on the chip so then you run a real time compilation that has to be fast you adjust the droplet control and then things get different happening on the chip and the reason i wanted to have a fast compilation is because faults happen. And if there is anything that I learned during my time with biochips is that there is zero tolerance to faults when you talk about diagnosis. So one of the most um, kind of fault reasons, common fault reasons, is the split operation. What you see here is a split that results in two unequal daughter droplets and unequal volumes lead to unequal, unequal um, concentrations and eventually lead to incorrect results. Um, so you want to solve it as soon as possible. I proposed error recovery strategy that are based on my fast compilation. Um, so looking at the split operation, whenever I have a split operation in my graph, I adjust the graph and I insert a sensing operation that takes the droplet to a sensor to check the volume. In case I have an error, I merge the droplets again, and then I split them again. And if I don't have an error, I just continue. It's pretty much like restarting your computer. So if we have a split that's erroneous, we just merge them again and we split them again. But then I thought about looking at errors or faults in any type of operation at any moment during the execution of the graph. So, for example, if I have an error in this operation, one way to recover from it is to start creating the droplet from scratch. So pretty much you run again the subsequence of the graph that creates the droplet. This is called time redundancy because it uses time to reproduce the droplet. Another way to work with it is to use something I call space redundancy. Um, sometimes you have available space on the biochip. So what if you can run a replica, like a backup copy of your bioprotocol on the space available? In case you have an error during the droplet, um, you just discard the droplet and replace it with a correct one. Now, this uses space, and in case you don't have an error, it may use additional reagents, which are expensive. So, 
there is kind of a trade-off, we call it, between the two ways of doing error recovery. Um, in order to solve the trade-off, I propose a couple of algorithms that will choose when to use space redundancy and when to use time redundancy, which situation works better with one and which situation works better with others. Now, this type of algorithm can be used in a static approach, which means that you take your initial bioprotocol, you determine all possible scenarios for all possible errors, considering a maximum number of error. Um, on the green edges, you find the scenarios for non-faults when there are no uh, errors, and on the red um, edges for when there are errors. And then you load the whole big graph with the error scenarios on the computer in the algorithm, you determine the results offline that are stored on the microcontroller, and then the microcontroller toggles between them according to the scenario whenever they are needed on the chip. Now, there is another approach, which is a dynamic approach. And the dynamic approach means that you determine your actions while things are happening on the chip. Sometimes, if the algorithm is fast enough, you don't even have to pause the droplets. You recompute really quickly the graph and you determine new droplet movements according to how, what is happening on the chip and what kind of errors you determined. Um, the next thing I looked into was, I mean, you remember that I want to bring these biochips and this technology in the hands of people. So I was wondering how accessible are these biochips for microfluidics? So I'd like to kind of do a survey, like ad hoc right now. So can you just lift your hand if you've ever used droplets in your research, um, even if it's an informatics level. So just hands up if you use droplets. Okay, and how many of you have used microfluidics in their research? So a bit less than the people that use droplets. And sometimes microfluidics are simply not so accessible uh, or, or making them. So I wanted to see, can I make microfluidics much more accessible? Um, and in the context of do-it-yourself bio, I co-designed with people that are interested this simple device that is made of printed circuit board or PCB technology. My um, goal was to make that people could make it themselves. Um, so as I mentioned, it's quite simple. Each one of these electrodes is connected through a via, and they have some high voltage transistors. This is an older version of it. And each one of these transistors is controlled by a high voltage power supply that can be regulated from 50 volts to about 260 volts. Um, controlled also, the high voltage is controlled by an Arduino. So quite simple design. Um, the most complicated part was coating the electrodes. The layer in between the electrodes and the droplet is crucial for making the droplet move. And the ones that are going to join my workshop on Sunday, I'm going to learn a lot about that. And what happens usually in the lab is that you use quite high-tech substances like Teflon or, or Perlincy or other types of substances. You spin code them, you bake them. All these technologies are not available for people at home. So we looked a lot into available solutions that could be applied quite simply by using silicon oil and different types of dielectric films that you have in, even in the household and mount them on chip in a very easy way. Now, the device can move droplets, can merge them, and mix them. And I'm just going to um, quickly focus on the fact that merging and mixing are not the same. Merging happens instantaneously when two droplets are in the same location. Mixing means achieving concentration, um, homogeneous concentration. And the droplets need to be mixed in a very specific pattern because there is a small flow inside of them. If you look at this video carefully, and you can find it on YouTube, you can see that the yellow droplet still pops from time to time inside the other droplet. So actually, if you move them back and forth, you can actually demix them. Then with the top layer, the biochip can also split droplets. And recently, we managed to also manipulate droplets of biological nature. Um, so we didn't play only with water and ink. Now, you have to believe me, they all look the same, um, because biology is mostly invisible. But you have to believe them that the annotations are right. 
Um, and of course, we built a very simple platform for those that don't know how to program Arduino, so they can use drag and drop to, to manipulate their droplets. And uh, the next step for me was to go and talk about this uh, platform and give workshops. So what you see here in the back, um, I am at a molecular communications conference in Dublin, and it's full of very big names uh, from Bell Laboratories and ARM Research, mostly computer scientists. And my goal was, can I motivate people that don't have microfluidics and or biology background to go and do research in this field and use their knowledge to leverage the field. So I gave a lot of academic workshops at Embedded Systems Week, Duckstool, and then in many other places. And the result after two years of releasing the platform uh, open source and giving all this workshop yeah, is that we got mostly um, followers from academia and replicas, and the best is that people took it and forked it and made it much better. So that's a really, really good result to have. Um, I'm really concerned in my vision as well about the ethical aspect. Okay, I develop a technology that has really powerful potential. How are people going to use it? And who is going to use it? Um, so I'm really looking into training people to have the right mindset and approach and have a critical view on technology. And I'm looking into what I call building community wet labs. Um, what you see here is me, and it looks like you know, it looks like I'm in a bio lab. I'm actually in a bio art laboratory in Helsinki. So a laboratory that's open to artists, to the biologically wor biological work. And I'm performing a PCR uh, on one of the devices developed by Wurz Gaudens, uh, a member of Hacteria. And moreover, um, I am also a biohacker like Wurz and like many others. So a biohacker is pretty much a maker a hacker, a builder, that is playing with biology. And um, if you're wondering where can it be done, it can be done at home. Actually, this is an iconic picture whenever you see an image, whenever you see a talk about it or self-bio. Um, what you see here is Kahal Garvey. Um, he is from Ireland and he's notorious because many years ago, at only 26 years old, he was the first person to have a fully approved laboratory in his kitchen at home. So he could do genetically engineering procedures at home. And for those, most of you are from Europe, so in Europe you know that's highly regulated. Um, it requires a lot of um, approvals to be able to do that. Um, one of the initiators is also J.J. Hastings. In the context of U.S., it's a bit easier to get such a biolab at home in terms of approvals, but also hard to do because of uh, all the equipment that you need to do. So, um, of course, biohacking doesn't happen only at home. It also happens in community. And uh, the biggest community in Europe and Asia is Hacteria. It has a web page where it collects a lot of information about all sorts of procedures that you can do at home. And it combines art and technology with a lot of group uh, cool people. Uh, one of the places that I was fortunate to be part of as a chairwoman is Bilogi Garajan in Copenhagen. And one that I co-founded in Berlin is called Top lab. Now, what does it mean to have such a community lab? And I was asked to give a presentation on that because people are interested to see if they can open one, maybe here, maybe in Ukraine, maybe in their local places. Well, of course, there's the question of infrastructure. How can you acquire expensive and sometimes inaccessible equipment? Even you, if you may have money, you may not be able to, to get it. So. Usually we get donations from universities, um, sometimes from pharma companies. Of course, there's always not a free lunch, so sometimes such donations that can create friction between members of the community, because there's always a question of what is the interest of the person donating. And the best approach is to make it yourself. So there are various ways in which you can hack different things to have it themselves. I mean, here's a classical incubator built with a little bit of, you know, heating unit can be done even as simple as with a bulb um, and a controller. Um, and this is a version of fully laboratory equipment that's being hacked by, by Wurz from Gaudi Lab in Switzerland. Um, and it's functional. I used the PCR machine quite a lot uh, when I was in Helsinki. 
Um, another example is the open PCR. Maybe you've heard of it. That's done from a biolab in um, US. Um, so the history behind it is that 20 years after the patent expired, um, some engineers decided, decided to design an open PCR and you can acquire it for 600 euro or you can build it yourself in case you want one. Um, another example is Bento Lab, that's from um, UK, the biohackers in the UK, and that wants to achieve also an integrated lab. So what you see there is somebody placing something in a mini centrifuge, and it has an incubator, and it's being developed as a kit for high schoolers. So it's being used a lot in high schools to teach them about protocols. Uh, it's a portable laboratory that can go from place to place. The next question or challenge that you have when you have such a community wet lab is about ma ma biomaterials. They are expensive um, and money is one issue. Another part, another issue is that you cannot access them unless you are affiliated with an institution in many of the countries because of the regulations. So a way to come around it, and this is my personal notebook, is to develop your own medium. So what you see here is the medium that I use. Uh, for different types of bacteria that is homemade and is replacing traditional laboratory substances with over-the-counter um, materials that you can get from the store. Um, so some of these recipes are absolutely developed over years by working with the organism and getting to know it uh, very well and how it reacts to different concentrations. Um, the third challenge that we have is what I call the lab coat challenge. And this is a big discussion, especially in Germany. So the question is, do we deserve to wear the lab coat? A lab coat signifies, in, at least in Germany and the European context, about seven years of research out of them, um, you know, not to mention the PhD after, it signifies a certain type of experience and scientific background. And what you see here, um, it's me um, surrounded by artists, actually. We are in Helsinki and we are performing some genetic engineering experiments. So we had a huge discussion after that and we still follow up. This, this um, photo was taken in 2015, this is when the event took place, uh, whether I mean, who deserves to wear the lab coat and where the authority stands? Who, who has the responsibility? Um, the advantages of having such places is that it advances the education. Um, knowledge should be open, and I'm firmly believing in that. And um, the, knowledge, the knowledge should not stay closed in different forms like academic units or hard to access academic papers. And by hard to access, I don't mean that you have to pay a price for it. We are fighting a lot against that. It means that it also, that the papers are expressed in a very um, specific language that is hard to understand by people that are not part of that research. Since most of the research is founded by taxpayers and by people around, and it goes eventually back to people, I think it's also our duty to teach more about what we're doing. So um, I'm going to show a couple of events that I did in different scenarios. Here I'm having a bacteria workshop at Art Laboratory Berlin. This is um, a place that does citizen science and combines art and science um, in Berlin. Um, Akut macht neu is a place for art also in Berlin with absolutely random people with different backgrounds, diverse backgrounds. Maker Fair, that was fantastic that they took their glowing bacteria at home and waited for it to glow and then struggled to take a picture. It's very hard to, to catch it on camera because it needs long, long exposure and then send it to me. So they're very happy to be able to grow their glowing bacteria. Um, this is an algae bar uh, where we have a microalgae installation. This is, is the green cyanobacteria that you see here. And then we have the drinkable edible versions of cyanobacteria that we pour into people's beers to make them green. This happens uh, nearby Copenhagen, and we have kind of an internal joke about the green tuborg, which is a local beer, at a techno festival. So there's this dark room um, with, with music and a lot of people, and then we have the green corner with our um, installation. Um, a lot of them 
um, events or workshops, they teach a lot about us. Um, this is a workshop in which we used um, our own microbiome to create um, yogurt, and this is the board that we had to discuss what it meant for us. And you can see here that we had a discussion about the origin of yogurt and about food as a social event, uh, about smell, microbes, immunity. We talked about the yak and yummy factor, the ritual, we also talked about things like, when is it my own? We used white cultures. And if we do sequential isolations, does it become a generic yogurt? It's not my own anymore. So um, these kind of events don't only educate people about bacteria, life cycles, ourselves, the connection that we have. It also tries to learn how we deal with the world. My goal is, in general, that people leave the events and they see the world that they usually don't notice because it's invisible, they see it with different eyes. So, um, this is a click festival. Uh, what the kids did here is that they extracted their own DNA and they were wearing it around their neck. Um, here is a workshop on cyanos again. Um, plant workshop. Um, so, there is a question that I'm kind of asking myself. Would mobility, automation, portable laboratories, access to education redefine what a biologist is? Who is a biologist? Is it going to become very widely spread, um, like other domains where everybody is, for example, programming today to what to some extent. Um, uh, either they are doing a small script to their website um, or they are doing a, an operating system. Uh, would biology become to a certain level and everybody participate in the development of biology and biotechnology? Um, here I am at a techno music festival in a corner running microfluidics experiments. Uh, it's actually a colorimetric experiment that I'm running with people that are interested to learn more about chemistry on it. So back to the big question that I asked, what is the extent that we can change healthcare? And of course, I am a firm believer that in the future, at some point, we'll all have a personal laboratory they can carry around. However, there are quite a few research problems that need to be tackled beforehand. So just to wrap up, at hardware level, we need a very good, robust platform. It needs to be mobile in the true sense that it needs to resist different angles, shakes, vibrations. It needs networking capability and communication of the results. Um, also, a software level. Um, I talked a little about compilation, fault tolerance, design automation. How can you automate um, the design of very specific biochips and fault tolerance stemming both of them? We need some editors, ideally an integrated um, development for that services, application, and there is another layer, which is society layer. We need to have expertise embedded in it and ethics. And I tackled um, a little bit, um, tackled a little bit these aspects. I'm going to talk more on Sunday at my workshop, very detailed. Um, please um, join if you're interested. And um, I would like to conclude with an image that we probably all of us know. If not, this is how computer science used to look in the past. And this is how it looks right now. And this is how a bio lab looks in the past. And I hope you see the similarity with a computer lab. And the question is, would this look like that in the future? And yeah, so now I'm open for questions. Thank you so much. Questions? Uh, so, uh, some of the trends that I see now is that from one side uh, we have uh, hardware becoming more accessible and cheaper, but from another side we also have, I think, similar to what we have uh, with web that we get different robotized uh, cloud platforms. So I'm curious about uh, your opinion how uh, microfluidic uh, biological clouds and uh, uh, 
uh, DIY devices can interact and uh, have you ever thought about making a uh, cloud lab based on your microfluidic devices or maybe a virtual lab? Uh, I think from the technology point of view, that is very easily achievable. So the question is, once we have a platform based on biochips um, or on microfluidics of any sorts, maybe the, the mini drops um, um, based systems, and we get results, do we use the cloud-based technology to share it? And from a technology point of view, this is very easy to implement. From a cultural point of view, that's a questionable thing. So the culture and the mindset in the laboratory needs to be um, changed in a way that it encourages collaboration um, and collaborations among labs, and then also sharing what we call negative results, so failures. So that's a very important aspect of it. And I think um, having a cloud-based system, as you called it, would encourage people to share also negative results, so also failures, and that would promote the research much faster. More questions? Uh, have you tried running your system on the live cells and would they be affected by such high voltage? Yeah, this is a very technical question, but it's a really cool question. So the, op the voltage that um, can be used to operate such droplets can vary between the lowest reported ones, 11 volts, to the highest I've seen on crazy YouTube videos, 7,000 volts. Now, the voltages I use on, on the device that I, pre I presented and on my devices vary between 110 volts DC and 300 volts DC. Um, the cells are not affected by that. Um, so we can have um, cells that stay alive and after they've been traumatized by the voltage, are still alive. There is no current going through it, so it's only f electrical field. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, so, I suppose that I can get, um, I can find a way to get this device, um, like maybe in a month from now, and the question is, what can I actually do now. <laughs> yeah, so the device you can make it yourself, as I said. Uh, you download the files, you order it from a PCB company, you solder it together, and you have a device. Um, what you can do is that you can start working with the um, substances that you have in your laboratory, so for your bioprotocols, and try them out to see if they have the microfluidic requirements to be manipulated on such chip. And I'm going to talk a lot on Sunday about that. Um, the surface tension of the substances of the reagents matter a lot. Um, so reagents and samples. And you can be lucky that they are mostly aqueous or water-based, and then they work perfectly on it. In case that's not the case, in case you're dealing with more viscous substances, then you need to dilute them with surfactants. So you are, su you are suggesting that it's fairly easy to make uh, to adapt uh, some protocols uh, that someone I is. I never using. said that. I said you can start testing your droplets in the lab, but that's a really big question and cool question. I'm actually. You also talk talked about the library of uh, available yes. protocols. Yes. So um, the library is of available mixers, uh, which is at microfluidic level. Um, uh, is not at the biological level. Uh -huh. um, so, just to clarify, I'm going to use a few um, a few seconds to clarify that because it's very important. So, at microfluidic level, um, the way the droplets interact with each other um, is tried to be characterized in a generic form, and that's the library I was talking about. Now. All those characterizations need to be proved by your very specific bioprotocols. The question was brilliant because the question is how easy is it to adapt an existing bioprotocol that you have in house? As you said, can I just take a device and run my common bioprotocol? Well, it's not easy. That's why they're not so common so far. Um, the reason it's not easy is because um, although you can I mean, some of the things are missing, like centrifugation, for example. So you need to adapt that part and see if you can use magnetic beads for, for phase separation or some kind of workarounds. But assuming you don't need centrifugation, 
the scaling down the bio protocol doesn't work linearly. So you cannot just divide to 10 to the power of four. You need to test out the new volumes. And this is the current work I'm dealing with. Can I use a software-based system that would allow you to run really a lot of iterations to adopt, adapt any bioprotocol for microfluidic volumes. Um, so yeah. yeah. That's good to know, interesting. <laughs> More questions? Would it be possible to disrupt the solar membranes using your device or voltage is not enough? Like, can you also put like a magnetic field and so on? So, uh, magnetic field is not a problem. You just add a magnet on top, on the bottom, depending how you build it, and you have a magnetic field. You can disrupt it. Um, um, there is work, I've not done it personally, using electroporation on a modified such chip. It's a very recent work from, I don't know, half a year ago. So, um, that makes the cells compatent, and then you can do transformation. Um, so, it is possible to do that, yeah. So maybe the last short question. No, everybody is tired. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much.